It was small and was portable uh, and had good image quality based on zone sonography. Uh, it was very exciting. It was different. How to make a professional artist become a scientist and make every image look very beautiful? You can see a pregnancy from four weeks after the last period. With the probes that we're using now, you can actually see the pregnancy inside the uterus. All of these uh, we found very, very exciting. One of the nice things about medical is when you do better within there, you're also helping the community to do better and improving their lives. In our whole 10, 20 years of research, we have been able to maintain the relationship with the doctors and communication. 我们呢和迈瑞公司的研发部呢，常年呢都有一个战略合作。我们临床有什么需求，可以开发哪些功能来更好的帮助临床？双模态超声弹性做中心研究是从二零一六年的七月份在深圳启动的，涵盖了国内的东西南北中十几家医院进行共同研究。专家的这些经验。洞察以及他们的一些创新的这个想法，都能依托我们的技术、我们的平台，得到非常好的这个实现。通过 Smart MSP 的一键成像，可以让年轻的医生来做这样工作。That's unique in the industry。融合产生了非常多的临床应用中的创新，包括智能化的可视化、胎儿面部的自动的导航、去除百位百症。等等，这些都是我们智能化的应用的具体的实例。It's really transformed the problem from something that was hard limitations to more of a、uh, soft limitations of how much computational power you had. 它可以吸收众多专家的呃经验，来整合成一个系统。这样的话，对病人来讲，在一个二级院甚至一个社区院。或者一个大的体检中心，他也得到一个呃相当水准的医生在做诊。This is what makes a difference in patients' lives. 不同的应用部位、不同等级的医生的应用需求也是不一样的。创新的需求、提升工作效率的需求、提升诊断质量的需求，需要智能化的解决方案。所以，我们的预智能平台在这方面实际上还有着非常广阔的潜力可以去挖掘的Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sonobus Virtual. This is now the final preview series or the prelude series that we've been doing as a lead up to the Sonobus conference that's going to be held from tomorrow. That is Jan 3rd to 10th. We have more than 2,000 registrations. So thank you very much, everyone, for registering for this event. And right now with me, I have a close friend, Dr. Prashant Patil. He is a, a wonderful radiologist who did his uh, training from KM Hospital, Mumbai. And practices to the president of uh, the IMA of the Kalyan chapter. He is a very active member of uh, the Manasa State Radiology of Imaging and also is one of the prime movers of uh, the Ultrafest uh, program that has been uh, held over the years. So Prashant, welcome very much. Thank and you. Uh, you can please get started. His talk is on uh, fetal kidneys. So you can just screen share. Yeah. 
and just open the PPT. Yeah. And you can just click on uh, the button, hide button next to the stop sharing here. Yeah. Full screen, please. Yeah, great. We're good to go. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Sanju, for that welcome. Uh, first of all, I'd like to wish Happy New Year to each one of you. Last year was very tragic for everyone, but definitely 2021 is full of happiness and joy. I would like to thank uh, my mentors uh, who brought me in Maharashtra Radiology, Dr. Sanju Mani, Dr. Jignesh Tucker, and Dr. Shalindra Singh, who gave me this opportunity to connect with you all for a very uh, common entity, which we find in our routine ultrasound practice, fetal echogenic kidneys. As we all know, if fetal kidneys have varied appearance in all three trimesters. In first trimester, around 12 weeks, the kidney looks like two hyperechoic paravertebral structures. In second trimester, the echogenicity of this uh, the hyperechogenicity of this kidney get reduced and they are more hypoechoic. And in third trimester, it is possible us to differentiate between the cortex and medulla. The renal pyramids are hypoechoic. And we can see the renal pelvis well defined. So these are the various appearance of the kidneys in all three trimesters. Uh, we do a lot of uh, renal measurements. Among that, long axis of the kidneys is very important because it usually correlates with the gestational age in menstrual weeks. For example, if you see the first image, uh, we can see the long axis measurement of the left kidney is 1.7 centimeter or 70 millimeter and it is corresponding to the 17 18 weeks of gestational age and similarly we can see in the second trimester and the third trimester images also the long axis is co uh, is correlating with the gestational age so keep up the habit of measuring the uh, kidneys in your routine practice uh, when we see the kidneys how to uh, label it as echogenic we have to compare the echogenicity of renal parenchyma with the adjacent organ, liver, or sometimes spleen. In the first image, we can see the kidneys are elliptical in shape, hypoechoic. And in the second image, you can see the kidneys are enlarged and the echogenicity is definitely very high in, uh, in relation to the liver or the spleen. So such kidneys, we call it as echogenic kidneys. Now, echogenic kidneys are a component of various diseases. We have categorized them. The first category is cystic renal disease, where we have autosomal recessive polycystic renal disease, multicystic dysplastic kidneys, autosomal dominant polycystic renal disease. The second category is obstructive uropathy. We have anopyloides, which are associated with echogenic kidneys, like trisomy 13, 18, 21. Infections like cytomegalovirus candida, syndromes which are associated with echogenic kidneys are back with Weidman syndrome, Perlman, tuberous sclerosis, Meckel-Gober, Bardet Beadle syndrome. There can be physical variation related to echogenic kidneys, which I'm going to talk in my uh, for next slides. Phys uh, miscellaneous causes like uh, some uncommon causes, renal vein thrombosis, congenital nephrotic syndrome. When you see a kidney and when you want to label it as echogenic, you have to follow certain parameters. First, confirm it whether the kidney is really echogenic by comparing the echogenicity of the renal parenchyma with the liver. Always use high frequency probe. Here I have written if required, but I usually use high frequency probe because it, uh, it gives me opportunity to study the renal parenchyma in depth. Decide whether the kidney is unilateral or bilaterally involved. Check for the presence, uh, check for the renal cyst. See the morphology of the cyst, whether they are communicating or not, you have to see. As I said earlier, we have to measure the kidneys because that decides the 
a classification uh, where we have to uh, define the kidneys. We have to go for other GO abnormalities. We have to see extra renal manifestations like skeletal or CNS involvements. Ask for a relevant family history. This flow chart is very important. It simplified our approach to echogenic kidneys. Now, if you see an hyperechoic kidney and the volume is increased with the size, uh, the renal size is increased, so definitely we'll be thinking for the polycystic kidneys. And if you see macrocysts, then you are dealing with multicystic kidneys. Now, if the polycystic kidney is associated with extra renal abnormalities, uh, especially the musculoskeletal or the CNS, then we are definitely dealing, then the uh, kidney anomaly is a definite part of the well defined syndrome, like Bardet Beadle, Beckwith Weidman, Meckel Guber syndrome, Perlman syndrome. If the echogenic kidney is small in caliber, uh, small in volume, then we are thinking of cystic dysplasia or the Potter type 4 uh, uh, renal disease. If the hyperacute kidney is of normal volume, and it is not associated with any other extra renal uh, anomalies. Amniotic fluid in the uh, fluid volume is normal. Urinary bladder is well visualized. Such kidneys can be a variant of uh, can be a normal physiological variant. So this flow chart is very important uh, for our approach in echogenic kidneys. We'll see certain examples. Like uh, fetal cystic renal diseases are uh, have classic. I mean, they have a classification of Potter. So we have Potter type one, two, three, and four. So, so Potter type one is autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. In these images, we can see the kidneys are bilaterally involved. They are enlarged, echogenic, reniform shape is maintained. Corticomedullary differentiation is completely lost. Bladder is, is not usualized. It uh, usually associated with oligohydrominos. Now, if you see, when we use the convex probe, we can see the uh, high, highly echogenic kidneys. But when we use the high, uh, high frequency transducers, we can see small cysts which are developing in the renal parenchyma. So, this is the importance of the high frequency transducer. Our autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease are associated with liver fibrosis and severe pulmonary hypoplasia. Second Potter type 2 is multicystic dysplastic kidneys. Usually, the kidneys are unilaterally involved, they are enlarged, there is loss of reniform shape. We can see multiple uh, renal cysts, anechoic fluid field. They are not communicating with each other. We can see the renal parenchyma which is intervening between the cyst. Usually it is unilateral, but sometimes it can be bilateral also. Uh, urinary bladder is normally visualized in such cases. Amniotic fluid is usually normal, but if the bilateral involvement is, the fetus can develop oligohydrominos. Porter type 3 is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Bilateral, bilateral involvement is there, kidneys are enlarged, they are hyperechoic. But in this case, the hyperechogenicity is confined more to the cortical cortex region because the microcysts are formed in cortex. Medulla is usually sparse. So corticomedullary differ differentiation is relatively maintained. Urinary bladder is normally seen. Amniotic fluid is usually normal or mildly less. There, is a, there will be a definite history in parents. So family history should be asked. Type 4, uh, uh, type 4 uh, cystic renal disease is obstructive cystic dysplasia. Here, both kidneys are involved. They are highly echogenic, but they are small in size. You will see presence of renal cysts, especially in the pericortical regions. Urinary bladder is significantly distended. You will see the bladder walls are thickened and echogenic. The wall thickness of the bladder is usually more than 2 to 3 millimeter associated with oligohydrominos. So in uh, obstructive cystic dysplasia, uh, probably the lower urinary tract obstruction is a uh, causative factor, like posterior urethral walls. Here we can see, uh, because of the lower uh, urinary tract obstruction, uh, the uh, urinary bladder is well distended, keyhole appearance we can classically see. 
we can see the back pressure changes in the kidney in the form of hydrouretonephrosis. This is another classical example of megaloureter. See the urethra is dilated, and similarly, uh, urinary bladder is dilated. The walls are thickened and echogenic. Back pressure changes in both the kidneys, causing echogenic kidneys. This plastic kidneys, you can see the uh, unilateral uh, involvement. Tiny renal cysts are formed. Trisomies 13, 18, 21. You can see all these examples where echogenic kidneys are the part of this anoplardis. Fetal infection, especially cytomegalovirus infection, due rise to echogenic kidneys. Syndromes are highly associated with polycystic kidney. Polycystic kidneys are a component of many syndromes. There is a huge list. I will be discussing few common uh, syndromes. Uh, Meckel Gruber syndrome, normally most of the radiologists have seen this syndrome where uh, the components are polycystic kidneys, encephalocele, microcephaly, and polydactyly. If you see polydactyly, genital anomalies, and polycystic kidney, think of Bardet Beadle syndrome. If you see macroglacia, omphalocele, hemihypertrophy, along with polycystic kidney, back with white brain syndrome. Polycystic kidneys, diaphragmatic hernia, macrosomia, cleft palate, and dextrocardia, along with polycystic kidney, Perlman syndrome. So don't worry for the syndrome. You have to just you know, uh, you have to keep these syndromes in mind. Uh, the best part you can uh, 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 prepare a card, cardboard, and uh, keep it on your machine. So you can every time you can see okay, whenever the echogenic kidneys you see you have these syndromes in front of you. So these are the uh, few images for Meckel Gruber where you can see the encephalocele there, bilateral echogenic kidneys. We can see uh, you can see the polydactyly toes and the hand. Jobber syndrome, here also the echogenic kidney are part of the syndrome. Now, this is one condition where we have echogenic kidneys with polyhydrominos. The first common cause is maternal diabetes. But in case maternal diabetes is not there, then the one more common one more reason for echogenic kidneys with polyhydrominos is mutation of HNF1B gene. If there is a mutation of this gene, it gives rise, give rise to echogenic kidney along with polyhydrominos. So remember, whenever you see echogenic kidney with polyhydrominos and maternal diabetes is excluded, think of mutation of HNF1B gene. But sometimes we are stuck with echogenic kidneys. Both the kidneys are looking echogenic, but rest of the parameters are normal, like urinary bladder is well visualized, amniotic fluid is normal. There are no uh, uh, extra renal manifestation. In such cases, you might be dealing with a normal uh, physiological variant of echogenic kidney. But you can label this kidney as a uh, physio normal physiological variant. But my personal advice is that you keep a watch on these kidneys. Go for a serial follow-up scan up to the third trimester. Because sometimes what we label as normal physiological variant can turn uh, into abnormal echogenic kidneys as the uh, gestational age advances. This is one example where the kidney was labeled as a uh, no, normal physiology variant, but then it turned out to be abnormally echogenic and it, it was going toward a multicystic dysplastic kidney. Echogenic kidneys are usually uh, have good association with lycor. If uh, there is an echogenic kidney and the lycor is normal, there is a good prognosis probably like autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. But if the kidneys are echogenic and the fetus is developing oligohydronal, definitely the poor, uh, prognosis is poor, like we see in autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. So from the talk, what I will, uh, the take home message from my talk is, echogenic kidney can be a normal variant, but are also seen in association with the renal dysplasia, chromosomal abnormality, adult and fetal polycystic disease, Many syndromes like Perlman, Beck with Boydman syndrome, and cytomegalovirus infections. Kidneys are considered echogenic if the reflectivity of the renal parenchyma is greater than the reflectivity of the liver. Once diagnosed, other sonographic features of anopulardy, renal anomalies, and CMC infection should be sought. We should consider amniocentesis, torch titer, and fetal MRI to better evaluation of the genital urinary tract and renal parenchyma. Before ending this talk, I will again like to thank 
Jignesh, Sanju, and Shailendra sir for this opportunity. I always thank my academic mentor, a uh, mentor, uh, Dr. Moisha sir, who always guide me uh, in all my academic career. I will thank Dr. Rajesh Chobal for sharing me uh, some important images for this talk. So keep reading to make life easy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prashant. That was really wonderful. And thank you for being with us on Sonobuzz. Yeah. And uh, we have now our next speaker. This is Dr. Alka Singhal. Now, Alka Singhal has uh, been a specialist in ultrasound and only ultrasound. Okay, That's her speciality and her favorite. She currently is Associate Director of Radiology at the Medanta Medicity. She has written multiple chapters on thyroid and parathyroid in endocrine textbooks. She also has several publications on uh, the same conditions and especially in neck imaging, especially to do with parathyroid imaging. And uh, her idea is basically to teach us how to catch parathyroid lesions better, quicker, and faster. And her talk this time is uh, focused on that. So Alka, thank you very much for being on our program. And uh, you could just start by uh, just uh, do the screen share. We need your sound. We're not getting your sound. Sound. Is it? Yeah, this is fine. Yeah, we can go. OK. Um, and full screen, please, yeah. I'll just, is yeah. it full screen now? No, not yet. You can just go from the beginning, yeah. Is it now? Yeah, we're good to go. Yeah, thanks. OK. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for the team Sonabas for this wonderful platform and inviting me. And uh, so I'm out traveling, but I'm just again very passionate to share what I've learned through my life. And what I'm going to share today is about the parathyroid. So this area I feel has been really ignored by the radiologists because of the fact that I usually start with two to three outside reports which have either a discrepancy or a controversy that I need to solve. So now what are the parathyroid glands and where do we find them? The topic that I have in the main course is thyroid and parathyroid, but I believe I just wanted to share a little more about the parathyroid because I wouldn't be able to cover everything then. So we all know that they're very tiny glands that we don't normally see them. Superiors are usually behind the parathyroids and inferiors are usually around the lower pole of the parathyro uh, thyroids. But of course, there are ectopic parathyroids and there are lots of variants in supernumerary parathyroids as well. So coming to the... Uh, the the role of the parathyroid localization, we have to do a 3D localization on a 2D ultrasound as to exactly where it is located. How we do it, what are the landmarks and how do we see? Now on a transverse image, as we go by scanning, I will cover some video clips as well in the end and I have lots of cases. So depending upon how much time we have, we'll certainly go about them. So parathyroid is like a subtle hypoechoic and everything is between gray and white. So like this is CCA, this is the thyroid, this is the parathyroid. And here is the, this is the bowel in the esophagus here. So there are lots of things that look pretty similar. So you really have to be ha alert for it. And what is the clue? And is also a golden sign is the vascularity. So that brings us to what is the vascular anatomy of the parathyroids. Now both the parathyroids gland, the superior and the inferior, are both supplied mainly by the inferior thyroid artery. And this is actually beautiful. Once you actually grasp this point, you would have solved the majority of your parathyroid dilemmas in life. So the inferior parathyroid, so supposing if it's the inferior parathyroid, I can classically tell whether it's an inferior because the, see the way the inferior parathyroid artery comes and branches at the pole, as I'll show, as I'll show in the images. And second is the supply from the uh, both or third from the thyroid enema. So this is how when the inferior thyroid artery comes. So if you see a nodule and if you see an eccentric arc and if you see a polar feeding vessel that is branching at one of the poles and 
if it's coming probably from the below of the, uh, below the nodule that means it's the one, the one that's arising from the below and if it's the one which is this supposing the superior parathyroid it grows too large it would probably push down and accordingly the arrangement by the arrangement of the polar feeding vessel you can also label whether it's a superior or an inferior now technique we all know the best transducer that gives you the best resolution and be very thorough i use almost every possible available tool in my department and so of course the main main role is localization excessive nodules and um especially in the ectopic locations and associated pathologies characteristic images as we've all seen in textbooks and everywhere is it's just a typical ellipsoidal gland it's a little bit of eccentric arc vascularity but i'll just come to my clips in a minute so this is the grayscale image that you see typically normal thyroid now this normal thyroid picture may also not be there all the time so that also can be a challenge in diagnosing these parathyroid the vascularity vascularity pattern can also get altered by the thyroid uh, disease phenomenon so that can again be a comparative challenge to evaluate the parathyroid and do keep in mind but however the most important thing which almost everyone tends to ignore what is the first thing when we look for a g sac in a pregnancy is is anybody elevated serum beta hcg and majority of the cases a neck ultrasound scan is done without even having a look at what the thyroid parameters are what is the serum calcium level what is the serum parathyroid level once we begin a habit of understanding even for ptc and other recurrences the thyroglobulin levels if we tend to begin to look at those we will diagnose a lot more in life than we do right now look at the t3 t4 and t suppressed tsh or normal tsh or elevated tsh look at the serum calcium look at the serum pth i think these are pretty much basics before we proceed for any next scan the thyroid and parathyroid so of course theory we know what they look like doctor will go in the clips these are some static images of how parathyroid adenoma looks like hypervascular to the relative background thyroid that's the vascularity and they this is this is a static image of a polar feeding vessel that is just coming and bifurcating which is very characteristic and a very diagnostic sign and this just my data chart the chart and we correlate them with the system ab or the mb scan so most of the nodules which are over 1 cm size on ultrasound would usually often be i says they may be positive but my diagnosis goes a long way i do have found even a i mean i think it was a 5 into 3 mm or even 3 into 2 mm i don't remember for a pregnancy with thpt case it was just a very tiny one she was 7 months pregnant and she had hypercalcemia and she has loss of fetal movements and she had a previous iud and she came and incidentally this time the calcium was picked up so even the tiny ones that i remember i picked it up and the surgeon took a call for a surgery and then she delivered normally so you need to develop that eye the smaller ones are the more challenging this just my Uh, data that I presented in ECR 2018, which scored for publishing in WJOES World Journal of Endocrine Surgery, and it is currently in pre uh, pre print. So, so the point I'm wanting to stress out here is, apart from a single adenoma, there are often multiple nodules, and they often lead to failed surgery. So, do concentrate on multiple nodules. and of course this histopathology evaluation is an also an important point because i published a case where i thought it was ca and i told my surgeon to go for a hemithyroid at the along with and that was the histopathology so this is just a pictorial representation of why it is important to scan these patients very carefully because you can have a uh, more than one nodules that is the main 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 reason uh, so and locations we will come they we can have ectopic parathyroids now parathyroid normally are just next opposition to the thyroids 
but because of their embryological origin, as we all know, myths with the thyroid and the parathyroid, they can extend beyond or they can stand, they can be, they, their descent can stop before the thyroid. So accordingly, they will be undescended or over descended and ectopic locations depending upon the case and which have a lot of variation, a lot of sites. So superiors are usually around the mid pole, but topically they can be behind, even going behind as much as to retro, as into the retroesophageal group. Inferiors are usually around the lower pole, but they are more likely to descend. So this, this I find it a very nice way to scan. Put one lower end of the transducer on the sternal notch and put one upper end along the lower border of the thyroid. So the imaginary line that you draw, that is the thymothymic tract. Many a times you will see a little hypoechoic nodule, which is a parathyroid nodule in cases of hyper parathyroidism and vascularity, you might just find them there. So try this as a technique because if anything is beyond the sternal notch or the clavicle, it will only be diagnosed by CT. But our work area is up starting from the angle of mandible up to the sternal area. So that area we can always evaluate and look for the pathology in this window. So this is just the representation of the data that I saw in my cases. And so accordingly, so the majority of them ones are along the thymothymic tract. So that's what I was emphasizing. If that technique, you will find majority of the ectopic parathyroids. I mean, the utopic ones are easier because they are around the thyroid. The challenge comes in these ones. And then the ones which are upper mediastinum is when you don't find anything in the neck. And then you have to suggest the 4D CT or if sister maybe had enough active mitochondria that's another thing to take up the system maybe uh, contrast and show it up and the remaining are usually seen along the angle of the jaw a case that i have published uh, in the journal of head and neck uh, uh, surgeons and along the carotid teeth retroesophageal and intrathyroidal was another case that i've published in uh, journal of head and neck uh, surgeons and physicians so so what we found, of course, system may be fines in about 84% cases, but at our institute, um, ultrasound is localizing way more than system may be. And uh, it is complementary. It finds excessive nodules. It finds extra pathology. So these are just typical appearances on B mode that we have seen of parathyroid adenoma and hypervascularity that is a characteristic arc rim vascularity. Uh, many times this is like, uh, this was one of the misdiagnoses because this is a large sleeping parathyroid sitting behind, which hasn't even been looked, okay, might be just a musculature or something. And then when I scan and then my surgeon goes, how can a 25 centimeter parathyroid adenoma be missed? Can you please explain to me? I said, well, uh, so now when you put the color on, see this characteristic vascularity again, you need to understand that not everything is muscle or everything is uh, soft tissue. Everything has an anatomy and a signature in the neck and do concentrate on it and you will find a lot more. This is another one that was a misdiagnosis. Now, this is a huge parathyroid and this is a little bit of a compressed thyroid. So this is the system maybe picture and ultrasound, no parathyroid detected. So this was an outside report. So see, this is the thyroid, but the parathyroid is just behind. And when you go in long, it just gets, it's just laterally. So it just gets missed as a skeletal muscle or something. So you just have to really be aware in looking and scanning and recognizing these. I mean, this is the system maybe picture. I mean, these, these system AP pictures are two hour delayed scan. So you take a minute, a 30 minute image and a two hour image these days. So this is a bilobed parathyroid again. And these are atypical appearances, some with heterogeneity, some with separations and small cystic change. And then often we get large cystic changes as well as the uh, Lesion size enlarges and disease progresses. You can have larger lesions. So this is a large lesion. This is a large lesion with a little bit of vascularity. The importance of large lesions 
with a predominant cystic component is that they will be only showing this solid tissue area on the system EB scan. So for surgeon to understand the complete size and extent, he is relying, he or she is relying on ultrasound mainly. So our role is very important. And, and this lesion particularly was very deep and deeping posteriorly very close to the spine. So it becomes a challenge in surgery, like lesions which are very close to the carotid. That's what my surgeon likes as a benchmark, is it? Medial to the carotid, superficial to the carotid, deeper to the carotid, or, you know, how deep to the carotid, you know. So it just helps them plan their, so example, this is another lesion, which is very deep dipping, a large parathyroid adenoma, which is dipping deep into the posterior neck. That's the thyroid there a little bit, and that whole thing is the parathyroid adenoma. So these findings... And, and again, like for an for a novice or a beginner, okay, where is the parathyroid? I don't even see it. Oh, oh, this is the one. So the more we practice, the get better it is. My experience as I stand today is probably by today, I would say I would have scanned and diagnosed over 2,000 parathyroid nodules. I think so. I may not be overstating, but I see a lot of them these days and like, uh, and so many tyres and so many parathyroid nodule scanning that like I, I believe that I have gained a lot with all thanks to all my referring doctors and all my patients who have been very patient and scheduling appointments with me and trusting me with their work. So again, now this is a system maybe image of a patient with hyperparathyroidism with just a very tiny little uh, uptake at the lower pole. And on scanning, we have a large uh, cystic uh, adenoma, which is showing some debris and hemorrhage and collection. So the role of uh, ultrasound cannot be overemphasized. Correlation we can do. So these are these are be negative ones. These are very challenging cases. So I would say I could not diagnose these until say five, six years ago. So these are real a real challenge because whether these are lymph nodes or whether these are parathyroid adenoma is a challenge unless you really, really focus on the vascularity. That's the only characteristic. So this was one of the cases I sent in European Journal. And this was just another system, maybe negative, but we see two nodules. So I'll just, this is a case of MEM1. I'm going to show a clip of the same case. So there were four parathyroid nodules, two on one side and two on the other side. So this is one large one, this second one, and this is a tiny one, and that's another tiny one. So be alert for these. And this was another interesting one. My surgeon was quite, quite impressed with me that day because this was a system EB image which just showed an uptake at the uh, lower pole, and they were uh, planning and going ahead with the surgery for the left side, right? Uh, they thought probably it's an intrathyroid left side, but I told them that, to me, this probably looks like an adenoma. And what I see on the contralateral side, on the right side, a tiny little thing there behind with some vascularity that probably is the right parathyroid, inferior parathyroid. They went ahead with left hemithyroidectomy first. The PTH did not drop. They went ahead then with right inferior parathyroidectomy and then the PTH dropped. So what does PTH drop means? They do on the table a PTH test before they close the surgery. So again, this was the case I was talking of. It, it, this is an adenoma that appeared very heterogeneous. I said, that doesn't look like normal adenoma to me. Probably something more is going on. And the calcium levels were, I think, 13, 14. I mean, when there's very high calcium level, they do suspect the CA, parathyroid CA, and that was so in this case, very heterogeneous, heterogeneous vascularity too. So uh, how much time do I have? I'll just come to, this was a case of system EB negative. Uh, uh, this is case of an ectopic parathyroid at the angle of the submandibular gland, which is very submandibular gland and the parathyroid ECA, CCA, IGV. Very characteristic arc rim vascularity. It was such a signature. And the moment I did the scan, I went and my nuclear medicine um, colleague was opening up and seeing what was that. I said, yes, that was an ectopic one. So I'll come to the clips. <laughs> um, so this is a clip. So if you just see, try and focus, what can you see? 
something is very obvious on the left side, but was there only one or more than one? So we see a large one that is shown in a still shot. That's a one parathyroid, a left inferior, a large one. But then it shows there's a septum or something at the end. So that was another one. So again, so that's a, that's a parathyroid nodule. And then there's another one as we go down. This is in longitudinal image. There's one and there's another one. So coming to this same case in color clip, so again, we have vascularity here. And if you carefully trace it, you will see that there is another vessel that would be going there. So there would be one rim here and another rim. So they're probably two separate nodules. So this is in transverse. And then when once we go down, there would be another vessel leading so separately to this lower nodule as well. So that's probably two lesions. So this is the same patient on the contralateral on the right side. Again, we have two nodules. Why two nodules? See, again, two typical arcs are there. So that's why. So this was a case of C2, two, two, two feeding vessels. Very characteristic. So this was all four parathyroid nodules. Another clip. So this is another case that was like huge parathyroid but and the thyroid is very compressed and often when patients are taking you know thyroid supplementation for over like 20 25 years the thyroid's almost atrophic and you know uh it's hardly there and then it's the only parathyroid in front of you for those patients and who say and nobody sees the parathyroid i say i didn't see it i don't even see a thyroid where's the thyroid gone my colleagues call me sometime then i just say ma'am aap kab se dawai le rahe thyroid he said ma'am 25 saal ho gaye maine kaha see that's where so understanding the physiology of the patient is also very important. So this is just to show what a characteristic vascular arc and a feeding vessel. So see the characteristic vessel and you'll see the forking. It's just the characteristic forking. So this sign is very, 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 very diagnostic of a parathyroid adenoma. Find it and then you know this is it and you'll not go wrong. I mean, people... Just, okay, this must be just the esophagus or something, or just bowel and very vascular. Sometimes they are just really, really surprising how they are missed. So this is another as we scan. So what do we see? Okay, this has been reported as a nodule in the thyroid, a calcific nodule originally. But yes, it is a parathyroid nodule. You see a calcific nodule. So coming, I have a color clip also of the same. So this is a color clip of the same. Now, when I put the color clip, you see this characteristic forking and the vascularity that is there. So this is the nodule. See, there is a capsule also that is visible very clearly. So and there's a capsule that is there, but that can sometimes may not be very clear. But this pattern is characteristic of a parathyroid. So do keep that in mind and may, may all our radiology. This was... This is another case of all four parathyroids. I mean, it's it's easier now that I'm asking you to focus here. There is a superior parathyroid and there was an inferior parathyroid as well. So that's the same thing in transverse image. And going back on the other side, so we have another lesion. Uh, so please do let me know when you think I need to close the case because I'll have lots of cases add it so whatever we want to see so i've done with the clips i have a lot of uh, uh, still images and lots of interesting cases but uh, how much time would you like so, me to go on we have another five minutes at least okay yeah. sure yeah. so i'll just so like typical uh, cases that you will get so you will have patients with history rigs many times i feel their calcium has not been done. Even like these days, I've started even to write in the recurrent renal calcula and recurrent, you know, GB calcula, pancreatitis, advice correlation with serum calcium PTH. Nothing hurts. Many a times, hypercalcemia is an incidental diagnosis, and there's so many of them. They suffer with osteoporosis, they suffer with pancreatitis, and then they find out, oh, my cause was here, or oh, it was sitting here at the root of my neck, and I didn't even know. So as as it should come from clinician, it should come from anybody who sees it. I mean, if I see a patient with two or more calculi related pathology or hypercalcemia related pathology, uh, so I would really say ki, I advise the patients that calcium PTH stop. 
so it just helps so just just some static images i'll come to the uh atypical nodules um the static images and septations so there was some cystic changes so yeah so these are the ones when you develop those cystic changes and these kind of appearance these can be confused with a thyroid nodule agreed again if you closely look at these like this this has been reported as a thyroid nodule so if you closely look you will see that echogenic line question num point number one when you turn your, uh, then you will first is you have to label whether it's an extrathyroidal or an infrathyroidal i mean there are infrathyroidal ectopic parathyroid as well and then you get your color doppler on if you see that peripheral arc your color doppler settings need it need to be very precise for the same and when you appreciate that you would and in the background of a patient with hypercalcemia and elevated ph p parathyroid that would be the diagnosis so again, this looks like thyroid, but it is a parathyroid. Now, how? So because of the vascularity, because of the location, because of uh, uh, the mainly the eccentric arc rim vascularity and the location. So this is another one where an additional nodule was found in ultrasound. So you have to be very alert. So even though they just reported as one, it was either an extension of the same, but it does look like a bilobed one, but it was two distinct nodules on ultrasound as seen like this over here. So we have to be very careful. I mean, if you see lymph nodes at level six or something, they will be usually be having the typical shape and they will have a high lar vascularity. If at all, you can demonstrate vascularity. Vascularity is hardly demonstrated in these level six lymph nodes, very rarely. Level three and four often show those typical vascularities. You know, the old in Hashimoto's, the level six lymph nodes that I've seen, I barely rarely ever am able to see any vascularity so and parathyroid they will have their own characteristic vascular signature so it's very easy to spot them and you know and and see the location typically like posterior medial to the cca and this is the trachea and that's the parathyroid that parathyroid would be sitting in so describe that relationship and in negative cases i know it's a very challenging one like i even if they say that maybe I say still I want to see that photograph. Now looking at this photograph, I feel that I have a gut feeling that this side may milne ka to koi chance nahi hai. because it's such an equivocal negative. There's a slightly increased uptake along the right side. So by looking at this image, I get a lot more information. Of course, the good part of a investigation being done at our same institute is I can dig into the images at our institute and see it of the patients got it it does give you a clue so look at these images you will your diagnosis will improve you know where to put your energies and i use the hockey stick probe the tvs probe like uh you know uh, whatever available tools i have to go, go for a high frequency and um, get my diagnosis so this is very tiny one there and you might have need to find dual parathyroids so in cases of tertiary parathyroid, like very typical posterior medial, typical location and vascularity. Cystic parathyroids are again very important because they are very, uh, like I said, they are very, uh, um, easy to see otherwise. This was post renal transplant, multiple parathyroids. Now, in this, see the typical echogenic capsular rim here. So, this is very suggestive that these are not thyroid nodules. The patients, and this one is a little bit heterogeneous, but again, this vessel that is coming here and this kind of a forking pattern tells me that I'm thinking of a parathyroid very heterogeneous that's the appearances they can be Here again an equivocal case and this is by definition if it's below if it's not attached to the lower pole of the thyroid it's an ectopic parathyroid and then i give my surgeon the distance from this point to this point so this distance i have measured here so an ectopic parathyroid which is located about 
one centimeter, 1.5 centimeters below the lower tip. So the surgeon knows every day these days go for minim minimally, you know, focused thyroidectomy, right? Minimally, minimum cuts, right? So it just helps them plan accordingly. So again, there's a. This was a very nice, interesting one. I, it was pub, I published it, uh, got it published in Journal of Head and Neck Pain. This was a very confusing one. The patient finally went uh, abroad to get her surgery done for a review. It was thought originally as a parathyroid adenoma, but it actually turned out to be bilateral follicular adenomas. These were patient incidentally had one surgery, second surgery, and then there was a tiny little compressed parathyroid which was deep, which just popped up after this, that, and then she was operated. This was a learning one. So the main cases, of course, we have to see associated adrenal nodules, associated pancreatic pathology, associated um, thyroid malignancies, and this was the case that I showed in the clip as well. Um, all four parathyroid nodules here. So I think we are pretty much done. Parathyroid carcinoma we discussed, fuzzy cases. And I think we'll just uh, wrap it up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the listening. And uh, and this was another case that I'll come to. This is another, this was a very interesting case. Now this looks like a cyst. It's got a capsule and it's extra thyroidal. So it's a parathyroid cyst probably. So this patient had a typical adenoma on one side and a parathyroid cyst on the other side. So the point of relevance here is that these cysts can sometimes go on oozing the hormone from the wall. They can be functional, they can be non-functional. And this case has just very recently been published in IJRI, parathyroid adenoma eclipsed uh, a cyst so role of adjunct imaging so they would not have known had i not pointed out that i also see a cyst on the other side so they removed this and it was a typical cyst and it was a it was probably functional in that case i'm not 100 percent sure about that but yes it did it did need its surgery and it needed to be removed and in equivocal cases of course we need to do a ct and that does help so my request to everybody who's here on the call is that parathyroid, diagnosing a parathyroid adenoma is looking for a GSAC in elevated serum beta HCG. If there is an elevated serum PTH, unless it is in the mediastinum, if it is in between the angle of mandibles and the clavicles, we do, we do, we do have all the tools to find it. So please concentrate and you will find them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alka. That was really wonderful. I've never seen so many parathyroid adenomas in my entire life. <laughs> so that was like really wonderful lecture. Thank you for being with us. And we'll see you again in the neck imaging section, which is on Wednesday, right? Yeah. Yes. Thanks so Thank much. You. Yeah. And Thank now, you. Thank you. Now we have uh, Dr. Mark Sklansky. I hope he's in the room. And uh, oh, we just have, oh, yeah, he's there. Hi, Mark. Good to see you always. Yeah. Thank you for being Good there. And, Hi, uh, Mark. Thanks. How are you? And uh, Hi. Mark, Mark needs a, may not need a formal introduction because he was with us at uh, Sonobuzz in yeah. 2019. And uh, he just uh, wowed us with everything, with his academics, with his humility, and with his warmth. And we are lucky to have him again, back again for Sonobuzz Virtual. Now, Mark Sklansky is a professor of clinical pediatrics. And he's a chief of the Division of Pediatric Cardiology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He's one of the pioneers of uh, fetal echocardiography. And uh, his focus of his clinical and academic interests has been basically always fetal cardiology. More so with a particular interest in improving early detection of major forms of congenital heart disease. And more so catching these conditions much, much earlier than we've been catching them. So today he's going to focus on that, just that. And it's over to you, Mark, now.
Thank you so much, Sanji. Such a pleasure to see you all. Yeah. Let me. Yes, uh, bye, bye. Bye. Nice to see you out there. Okay. Nice to see you too. Thank now, you. Sanji, should I click yeah. on my entire screen? Yes, yeah, we can go on screen share. Yeah. Yeah, and we can open the PowerPoint. Yes. Can you see? Yes, it's wonderful. And we just uh, click the yes, that's right. You yeah, we're, that yeah, last night. yeah. Oh, we're good, oh, yeah, we're good something to go. happened. It just went away. All right, we just do that again. Yeah, yeah, we're good. So, can you see? Yes, this is just fine. Thank you. So, I think this is you. <laughs> so, I want to thank. <laughs> okay. I wanna thank um, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Mani and Sona Buzz for having me back. It's uh, not quite the same as being with all of you in India, but this will have to do uh, for now. It's uh, really a pleasure to uh, come back even virtually to join some of you and to see uh, old friends and to even be able to learn a little bit about parathyroids from my friend, Dr. Alka. This is, yes. <laughs> this is I'm giving you a hint. This is uh, the way I'm set up here in, you're in our home <laughs> to get to get my laptop at the right uh, level on top of the panettone. So, um, yeah. So clearly, this is a conference covering all different aspects of medical ultrasound. This is very different from parathyroids. I'll leave that to Dr. Alka. I know nothing about that, but I do know something about heart disease and detection. And so. This is a talk about Sanji gave me free reign. I, you know, for a single talk for a conference like this, I, I wanted to just to talk in big terms in terms of how do we optimize um, outcomes for children with heart disease. I'm a pediatric cardiologist, and as pediatric cardiologist, uh, one, in the field of pediatric cardiology, how can a pediatric cardiology who is interested in academics and advancing the field, how can we? Um, what can we do during our lifetime to improve outcomes for children with heart disease? There's multiple areas, of course, that you could choose, and I've chosen to focus on early detection uh, because early detection really does make a huge difference in, and, um, in the lives of children with heart disease. And so that's how so many of you who are not cardiologists but who are radiologists or MFMs or others involved with prenatal ultrasound um, can help to advance, really make a huge difference in terms of uh, improving outcome just by making uh, detecting the heart defect. So I thought I'd start briefly just by mentioning that uh, most of you know heart disease is very common. Congenital heart disease is very common. It occurs, let's say, one out of 100 babies is born with a heart defect, you know, plus minus. Um, but of course, severe heart disease, critical heart disease is still quite common. Three out of 1,000 live births is, um, is um, a baby with a major heart defect that will require surgery in the first year of life, if not the first six months. And of course, heart defects represent the most common form of birth defect um, overall. Actually, if you add up multiple other forms of birth defects, they, their total comes to the total incidence of congenital heart disease. And it's also important to recognize that heart disease, heart defects, um, congenital heart disease are, accounts for almost half of all deaths that are related to birth defects. So it's a very important area to study. And I can tell you as a pediatric cardiology, it makes a lot of difference when we detect heart disease early. Um, and that's because most childhood deaths and most preventable morbidity from congenital heart disease occurs in the first hours or days or weeks after life, uh, uh, of life after birth, uh, usually because of a missed diagnosis or delayed diagnosis. And, and that's where you all come in, in terms of helping us around the world improve early detection of congenital heart disease. And of course, we as pediatric cardiologists and pediatricians, we can detect heart disease after birth, but there's so many reasons why it's so much so compelling to put efforts into improving prenatal detection. First of all, we're already doing an ultrasound prenatally in almost all pregnancies. Uh, Increasingly, that's true around the world, but of course, there are areas that do not, cannot provide that for, but for the most part, um, uh, many, many women are getting ultrasounds, a large percentage of women are getting ultrasounds routinely during their pregnancy. Uh, we do not do an ultrasound routinely after birth. Um, there's a very small percentage of congenital heart disease that we actually impact the prenatal 
natural history. That's very, that, which are, those are important defects to detect, such as aortic stenosis. Some cases may evolve into hypoplastic left heart. So if we can dilate that prenatally, maybe we can avoid the development of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. In some cases, that are very, that's a very small percentage of cases of congenital heart disease. The vast, the greatest benefit for um, prenatal detection is that we can and we can optimize the outcome, the outcome of these children, the short and long-term outcomes, because we can optimize where they deliver, uh, when they deliver, how they deliver. We can avoid early physiologic compromises because we know about the heart defect. If we need to start across the planet, we need to do a blue natural septostomy. Uh, and we can do that in, we might resuscitate differently, even in the delivery room. If we know the baby has cyanotic heart disease, we may accept a lower saturation and not try to increase the saturation and do harm. So clearly the right thing to do is to detect major heart disease prenatally, if we can. And I'm not gonna be talking, uh, in other talks, some of you have heard me speak about some of the data showing how we, we are still missing congenital heart disease around most places in the world, including here in Los Angeles, um, missing a big percentage of congenital heart disease, even major defects like tetralogy flow. So the question is, why are we still missing? For, for uh, any of you who are involved with prenatal ultrasound, scanning the fetus and doing screening of the heart, this that's the most critical element because if you, the one who does the screen can detect that maybe it's not just quite right, um, that's the way we detect heart disease. You don't need to be able to make the diagnosis. You just need to be able to say, this heart doesn't look quite right. Let's have it evaluated by someone else who has a little bit more expertise. <clears throat> and you may be changing, uh, changing the, this, that child's life and that family's life forever. So uh, why, why are we still missing congenital heart disease? I've been doing this for almost 30 years now and I scan every baby that I see, I scan myself. Sometimes I have the fortune of having a, uh, an ultrasound tech start the scan, sometimes I don't, but I always scan every baby. So how do we change? And this is, this is huge, this is a very important aspect. How do we go from what you see on the left to what you see on the right. What you see on the right is not the best, but if this is a this is an honest case where it's the same fetus. Um, this makes all the difference in the world, in my opinion, between missing a defect and detecting it. Uh, because so many times, this the, we, the way the heart looks um, when we start out is on the left, not on the right, and it takes extra time, and the guidelines have not um, typically address this issue, and I think that's a problem, but more recently guidelines are starting to address this, and I'll talk about that a little bit during this one talk. But before we get to, uh, to get there, how do we optimize the quality? Well, first you pick the right probe. I always will pick whatever machine I'm using, I'll pick the probe, the highest, highest megahertz, greatest number, and then if, you know, if I can get adequate depth penetration, great, but at least I'll try to get the best image quality with the highest megahertz probe. And then if that doesn't work, I'll move down. Optimizing the probe position on the maternal abdomen, and that's true, you have to optimize it one point in time, <clears throat> five seconds later, it may be a different place. Or, um, uh, and the other consideration is the optimal probe pro position on the belly, it may be the optimal position for looking at the crux of the heart, in one view, or it may be, but not the best probe position if you want to look at the pulmonary artery, or if you want to look at the four chamber view parallel to the septum or perpendicular, maybe a different position. So always vary the position on the belly continuously. Um, then you want to optimize the maternal position, mom on the left, mom on the right, mom on her belly for a few seconds. I do that sometimes to get the baby to move. Um, always very important to keep doing that to get the right angle and to optimize the image quality and the fetal position. How do you, how do you optimize fetal position where you have the mom go to the bathroom or jump up and down? We do lots of things for those of you who have visited, you know, there's lots of different ways we have, and I'm sure you do too, to get the baby to move. All very important, all take time, but it's important. And then I, I find that I do push harder than most perhaps with the probe, um, but that also can make a huge difference. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I've gone to people's practices 
and use their machine and they say they never knew they could get such great image quality and the only difference, the main difference was really that I was just pushing harder. Um, and then finally, one optimized depth and sector width and zoom. All these aspects are so key to improving image quality, which again is really very important in terms of detecting the heart defect. And that's just a couple examples, looking at a heart on the left before we optimize depth and then what it looks like on the right, you can see much, uh, see it much better when we just optimize depth. And then when the sex on the C, we're wasting on this resolution on the left. You don't want to be wasting on that resolution by all this extraneous um, uh, imaging. You just want to look at the heart. So narrowing this, the sector width and zooming up uh, goes from 35 to 114 hertz. You can see much, the heart much better. And when we're imaging the heart, uh, even at second trimester, it's 20 weeks, we're talking about valves that are just a matter of millimeters, um, few millimeters in size. So really imaging, the, the image quality is so key to detecting heart disease. And then the other aspect that I like to talk about that's really so key is optimizing the angle of acquisition. Uh, uh, this, what is this we're looking at? This is a... Uh, this is a uh, mirage, right? It looks like there's water on the, on the road, uh, but there's really not water. It's a, it's a fake out, right? It's an optical illusion. It's a, it's a mirage. And, and if you're driving, you see a mirage, how do you know if it's real or not, right? How do you figure out if the water is, is, is real? Well, you move your, you try to move the, your head up and down or you get closer to it or you move around to see it differently. And that's, that's so true for looking at the heart, de heart defect. Sometimes it looks like there's a VSD, ventricular septal defect, but it's really related to the angle and the perspective. And you move around and you can see that it's not really a VSD, it was just artifacts. So this, this concept of an optical illusion or seeing things that aren't there or missing things that are is related to the angle of acquisition. So we always need to be careful that we're looking at the heart in the right perspective. And that's part of the problem with 3D imaging. You can't just get a single volume and expect to see everything really well because there's angle of acquisition considerations that enter into 3D imaging just the way they do into conventional 2D imaging. For instance, when you're imaging that for a ventricular septal defect, you do not want to be looking parallel to the septum. You want to be looking relatively perpendicular to the septum. And this also has not been addressed very much in guidelines up until recently, um, but uh, it's very important. And here's uh, an example of how people may be wanting to look at the outflows with 2D. I don't know if I talk about color in this lecture. Color is another story, looking at color parallel. But when you're looking by 2D, this is not the way to look for outflow tract abnormalities. This is my favorite view, and if you know, I really love this view. I spend a lot of time trying to get this view, even with the LV on the bottom and the RV on top, <clears throat> seeing the septum relatively perpendicular. Rel doesn't have to need to be 100% more perfectly perpendicular, but relatively perpendicular. And seeing the aortic valve opening and closing, and the pulmonary valve opening and closing, you see how the aortic and pulmonary valves disappear during systole, and they're, uh, they're very thin and delicate and symmetric. And you can see how they cross. This, this, is a, there's not, this view gives you a whole lot of information that I find extremely useful. Um, and it helps rule out and check your septal defects, including aortic override that you have, say, with tetralogy flow. In many cases, double out the right ventricle. Um, also, we have to rule out transposition and other major defects, aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis. It's a great view for many reasons. <laughs> Related to this view, I call it my favorite view 2.0. It takes a little, just easier to stay in the same place, but you just a little bit of movement. It's very hard to, to say exactly what it is, but it's a very subtle movement away from, <clears throat> I'll go backwards, away from this where you see the alpha track and you're not seeing the inflow, because you're not seeing the mitral and the tricuspid valves. And then you come here, and you are seeing the mitral and tricuspid valves, and this is where we see the crux of the heart, where you, you always want to see this, the lower part of the atrial septum, and the inflow part of the ventricular septum. 
this info part, if you're parallel, it almost always will drop out. It will look like there's an in, in that BSD. So this is a nice view showing that it's, it's intact and that there's not an AV canal. Very important view. So uh, in terms of optimized imaging quality, <coughs> image quality, it's, not, it's more than just a checklist. You don't want to just look at abdominal. This is for fetal cardiac screening, but a lot of this applies to fetal echo as well. Um, fetal echo, we're looking at structures, not views, but still it's not just a checklist of structures or in the case of screening, a checklist of these views. So you want to see these views if you're in, in the context of screening or see the structures in the context of a fetal echo, but you want to do a, see these things views and structures well. It's not just a matter of seeing them, but you want to see them well and with appropriate angles. It makes all the difference. You can get a four-chamber view and click it off, but it's such a bad four-chamber view that you miss a major defect. So it makes a big difference. But it does take some time and takes practice, but it's, it's worth it. And another thing that's worth it is, I, in my opinion, is using color Doppler, even for low-risk pregnancies, even though the guidelines do not, um, most of them do not call for color Doppler for low risk pregnancies as a routine. This is a nice case. We see all four veins. Obviously, you don't always see all four pulmonary veins. I don't always see four pulmonary veins. I usually don't, to be honest, but I always will see at least one pulmonary vein and color can be very helpful sometimes to confirming that at least one pulmonary vein is normal, which of course rules out total anomalous pulmonary venous return, which is a very important lesion to pick up prenatally uh, because it makes a big difference in outcome but it's a very difficult lesion to pick up as well. But if you could find one pulmonary vein draining into the left atrium in every case, you'll never miss it. So this is a little secret to, uh, to improving prenatal detection and improving thereby outcomes for children with heart diseases. I like to use a foot pedal because I use two, usually we'll be using two hands um, to get adequate pressure and to be able to hold the probe steady exactly where I want it and to see exactly what I want often takes two hands. Um, but then how do you acquire the clip? I don't have another hand to push, so I use a foot pedal. But the, the concept is um, uh, using two hands uh, to scan. I think it's really very uh, key, key. My friends in Vietnam, I think, are calling me Dr. Two Hands because when I was there and we were demonstrating I did that as I have in India. It's, it's such a great idea, I think, for me personally, and I think many people who haven't tried it, when they do try it, find it's really useful just to use two hands. So let's change the page to and talk about um, some of the guidelines. See, <clears throat> these are not all the guidelines. I just picked two since I'm sitting here in Los Angeles, in lockdown in Los Angeles, another story. But, um, uh, um, I guess that's why we're doing this virtually. The for so we have North America. In North America, we use the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine guidelines and ISWA, the International Society of Ultrasound and OBGYN. These are guidelines for fetal cardiac screening. <clears throat> and these on the left, this this column, these components are what I consider to be really key aspects, both for of what we should be looking at and thinking about in terms of uh, screening and they pertain to fetal echo as well. Always wanna be incorporating clips. Um, unfortunately, AIUM in 2018 does not require clips for screening. I think color flow should be incorporated and not incorporated in either set of these guidelines. Four chamber and outflows, yes, of course, they're being required by these North American guidelines. Three vessel view, I think is really key Again, this is a single talk I'm giving this time. Um, we don't have time to go into all these details, uh, but uh, not required at this point in either set of these North American guidelines, but I think it should be and will be hopefully ultimately in the near future. Then angle of acquisition and scanning techniques that I just went over for you, not discussed at all, let alone required, not even discussed in AIUM guidelines and uh, mentioned in ISWA guidelines, but um, in terms of angle of acquisition for VSDs, but scanning techniques that I just went over were not were not mentioned or discussed. I think that's a mistake, and I'm hoping in the future that they will be. So let's think about that was for screening, but how about talking about fetal echo high risk pregnancies? These same considerations, if you look at the same considerations, 
these guidelines, AIUM and SWAG, AIUM came out in 2020, SWAG 2008, um, pretty much they're all included, except SWAG in 2008 did not talk about scanning techniques for fetal echo. So just to mention here, this is sort of interesting uh, because AIUM, the American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine, just came out with a revision to its fetal echo guidelines. Uh, the prior was in 2013 and now in 2020. Uh, <laughs> it's a bad word, 2020, but <clears throat> last year in 2020, I came out with uh, <clears throat> newer revised guidelines, which I was very happy to see angle of acquisition scanning techniques not included in 2013 are discussed in 2020. So I think that's a great step forward. Um, interestingly, they do include a cardiac biometry, which was optional in 2013, and pulse spectral Doppler, which was also optional or quote unquote adjunctive in 2013, now required um, all four valves to be measured and spectral Doppler, including ductus venosus, all four valves, Doppler across all four valves, and a, a single pulmonary vein on the right, a single pulmonary vein left to have spectral Doppler. So that's been suggested in the latest guidelines uh, to be required. Um, uh, topic for further discussion at some point. So uh, the first step then, of course, is in terms of optimizing outcome is detection. We've talked a lot about detection up till now, and now just what did you, but if we detect a heart defect, the, the detection alone, of course, does not mean that baby is gonna do better than the baby who was, whose heart defect was not detected. It's, it's obviously what you do with that knowledge. You make a heart, you detect that it's a major heart defect, the baby, the fetus has transposition at 20 weeks, or at 23 weeks, the baby has tetralogy of flow. What do you do with that information? Do you do further testing? What do you do if the, if the pregnancy continues? What happens about delivery? So on and so forth. So translating prenatal detection into improved outcomes doesn't happen instantaneously. Management and delivery of major congenital heart disease should be done by an experienced team. Now, this is major heart disease like transposition, <clears throat> uh, severe forms of tetralogy, things that we think may require early intervention. We Those babies with severe heart disease that we really are concerned about <clears throat> in terms of their transition, uh, they should deliver probably at a, ideally at a tertiary care center of excellence with an experienced team who knows how to deal um, with these, um, th with these uh, such patients. Um, and the other element that comes into this is, uh, which I didn't mention, which is whole other discussion is the importance of a collaboration between the person and the, the team who makes the detection, say the radiologist or the maternal fetal medicine doctor who detects the heart defect, and then the pediatric cardiologist and the other pediatric personnel who will be taking care of the baby afterwards. So that helps in terms of coordinating care and in terms of providing the appropriate counseling, which I'll talk about a little bit more. In the United States, there are obstacles, there's obstacles unfortunately, to translating prenatal detection into improved outcome. If you know you, the baby has a major heart defect, but what is what kind of insurance do they have? Where are they able to deliver? Um, what are their finances? Can they afford to go 300 miles to a center of excellence or not? And then there's political consideration. Who do you refer to? Um, uh, what kinds of testing is one doctor gonna do and not the other? So um, there's other, there are unfortunately some obstacles, but we can overcome those obstacles together to do the right thing for any individual patient. So I sort of wanted to mention a little bit about counseling <clears throat> because it's so important and this also, also emphasizes the importance of a collaborative team approach. The radiologist or MFM making the detecting heart disease and then the counseling of counseling should be done, of course, by someone with expertise in the area. Uh, um, but it also should be done with passion. And of course, this is um, seems sort of obvious, of course, but this is why uh, um, we all are doing what we're doing, why I love fet fetal cardiology so much because of the, the art of medicine and the time you spend with the family um, after a diagnosis has been made. <clears throat> and here's something I wrote just to leave with you before getting close to the end of this talk. 
Um, the, the fact is how we give bad news, you know, if a baby fetus has major, you have to tell the baby, the mom that the fetus has major heart defect, that's a big deal. How we give bad news may be remembered as much as the bad news itself. It's really true. Most of us know that firsthand. I certainly know that firsthand. We can practice uh, compassion-based medicine, or we can simply dispense the data to the most vulnerable in our care, just tell them the statistics, let them go on their way. But our patients will remember either way, which is very much true. I mean, patients will remember if it's a terrible heart defect, um, but they, they'll remember your compassion and how you, you're caring. Um, and the other way around, of course, uh, is true as well. Um, and then, of course, with expertise, the counseling needs to be done by someone who understands the field and what is the outcome, say, for a fetus with tetralogy or with, with transposition or with hypoplastic left. And what are the details that matter that enter it? Not all hypoplasts are the same. Not all tetralogy of flow babies have the same prognosis. So this is a study we did just a few years ago, which we call it How Not to Tell Parents About Their Child's New Diagnosis, of Child Heart Disease, Internet Survey, 841 parents. <clears throat> and they told us what they liked and what they didn't like about what the pediatric cardiologist told them. And in terms of percentage, highest percentages, they, they would have liked more information more in, in, uh, at, the uh, at the time of the diagnosis information in general, long-term issues they wanted more of. They wanted more statistics and survival rates um, in using written information and diagrams. Um, they wanted to learn about survivors and support groups, and they wanted more compassion and reassurance in many cases. So these are things that we learned from the survey that parents really want. Um, um, and so counseling should be done with compassion, but also with expertise. And this can be done collaboratively with MFM, radiology, OB, pediatric cardiology, and others involved with the care. So take home points, <clears throat> improved prenatal detection of congenital heart disease can be achieved with improved image quality and appropriate angles of acquisition. I put that first, just as a take home. Of course, acquisition of clips rather than still frame images, if at all possible. Um, color Doppler, even in low risk pregnancies, and which I didn't have a lot of time to go into, inclusion of four chamber view, of course, LVOT, RVOT, and three vessel views. Current guidelines, in my opinion, do fall short in important areas and should continually be reconsidered and revised over time. That's just natural that we're always going to get better at things and try to do, do more and more, and guidelines. Are, are the same and they continue to get better and better over time and but that's important for all of us involved who have ideas and um, opinions to voice them and to uh, um, take part in shaping how guidelines look in the future and then translation of early detection of congenital heart disease into optimal outcomes requires a collaboration between mfm and radiology and pediatric cardiology and other pediatric subspecialists surgeons um, and others, neonatologists involved in the care of the newborn baby with heart disease. And counseling following the prenatal di diagnosis of congenital heart disease should be performed with compassion and, and by those with uh, expertise relevant to that area who know not just what's the prognosis of a hypoplast or a baby with tetralogy, but what can be offered in that part of the world, in that community, in that hospital, in that city, something that's really relevant for a parent. You don't want to be quoting data that's true at a hospital that the patient has not, there's no way that patient's going there. You want to, you want to provide information that's relevant for that baby and that family. So finally, you know, clearly, uh, um, it's been a, 2020 was, it's actually a very fun, very happy to say was. But, uh, a uh, challenging year, but uh, I think there's a, uh, this is going to be a great year for all of us. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, we had many, many, uh, I had the pleasure of having some of you from India visit me and our group in Los Angeles in the past. And I've had the pleasure of visiting India and hope to do so again and hope to have many of you come and visit us in the future at UCLA. So with that, I think I'll end and thank uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjeev Mani again uh, and Sonabas for letting me join you and looking forward to joining you in person again in the future. Thank you very much and Happy New Year everyone. Stay safe.
thank you mark for a wonderful wonderful lecture really it's such a pleasure always listening to you and yes we will be calling you back there is something we have some unfinished business left we know that so thanks once again for being with us and for everybody else who's been watching this is the end of the prelude uh, that's taken place today tomorrow we start uh, the event which starts at 9 am sharp india time and we start with dr sheila sheth who will be speaking on gynec ultrasound the four back to back lectures she'll be giving and she's going to be staying up late almost up to midnight actually delivering those lectures because she's uh, talking to us from new york all of those who are troubled registering on the main site do not panic uh, it's a simple process and if you have any problem you please continue to send us whatsapp messages on our helpline and we'll make sure that you can log in very easily by 9 am tomorrow until then good night and stay safe bye bye yeah bye ma thank you bye bye